Um, most of you are familiar with what that phrase used to mean and, um, and what it's becoming now, but um, the best way for us to honor those who have given their life is to remember and to live as Americans and use our freedom for the good of humanity and of each other. We thank God for those who paid the ultimate price today. Psalms 127, verses 3 through 5 says, Children are heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like the arrows in the hands of the warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is a man who has his quiver full of them. Our children are going to children's church. Amen. So glad you all are here today. Sandy Kay, you looking pretty, girl. If you have your Bibles, um, we're going to pick back up in 50 Shades of Truish. Um, if you've missed any of these sermons, they're available on YouTube, so I'm not going to belabor um, the beginning that we started a couple weeks ago too much. But we talked about how there's a couple things that are infecting our culture and our nation and have filtered their way down into the church by default. And um, it is the subject of relativism and subjectivism. Relativism and subjectivism have infected America to the bone and by default, of course, have infected the church. And let, let, me, tell you, let me tell you a little bit about it um, just to remind you. According to the Oxford Dictionary, relativism is the doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical contacts. And there are no absolutes. Relativism says there's no absolutes. Now, now, you may think, now Ken, that, that doesn't relate to me, but, but hold on. I'm going to work it. I'm going to work it. That's relativism. Some of you are old enough to remember a lot of things were sinful that are no longer considered sinful by professing Christians. And I'm not just talking about other faith traditions. I'm talking about the full gospel faith tradition. There were things that used to, we used to consider sinful that are no longer sinful anymore, and they were either sinful or they're not. Okay? They're either sinful or they're not. I'm sorry, I, let me turn this off. Franklin Graham just texted me. Um, some things, are, if, if, if they were sinful 100 years ago, then they're still sinful. And, and you know, so, there are some things that we kind of realize were preferences and not sins. Okay? The next thing that has bothered, that has gotten down to the bones of America is subjectivism. Subjectivism is the doctrine that knowledge is merely subjective and that there is no external or objective truth. That there is no absolute truth. So subjectivism says 32 degrees might be freezing for you, but it ain't freezing for me. And, and when I say it like that, you say, well, that's foolish, Ken. Nobody would believe that. But people li are living under subjectivism and moralism and relativism. So since there's no such thing as absolute truth, I have the right to determine what is right and wrong with any outside authority telling me what's right or wrong of my self-judgment. So since there's no absolute truth, you cannot impose your truth on me. That may be true for you, but it's not true for me. And, and, and I use the example of, of a measuring tape. Um, so some of you worked or, or have used, anybody here not used a measuring tape ever? 12 inches is supposed to be a standard measurement on every, every measurement, right? When you get a yardstick, do you expect it to be this long? You expect it to be a yard, everybody. I want a trick question. That's right. That we have standards that we are supposed to go by. But they believe, uh, people who are infected with subjectivism believe there's no absolute truth. So how it translates to us is if, as, is if it feels good to me, I'll do it as long as it makes me happy. As long as I'm sincere... It doesn't matter what I'm doing. Have you ever heard that before? God knows my heart. What, what, you know what? God does know your heart. Matter of fact, the Bible says God knows your heart better than you know yourself. And no one and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you've lived life any amount of time, how many of you have figured out that there are some things you were sincere about and you found out you were sincerely wrong? I've been sincere and been sincerely wrong. wrong as well as long as I'm sincere it doesn't matter what I believe as long when no one gets hurt it doesn't matter what I believe subjectivism and relativism I, I'm getting I'm getting a, a something up here that's bothering me it might not bother y'all 
but give me just a moment. Please forgive me. I'm going to switch. What would you say? Check Emma's mic. Everybody say thank you, Emma. Nope, it's not Emma. Let's check Winnie's. Oh, it won't yours. Y'all forgive me. This is not part of our regular scheduled programming. All right, I'm just going to, I don't know where it is. It's no one else's. So relativism and subjectivism have, it's, it's still doing it. Um, relativism and, turn down the monitor for me. Go under monitor. It's all the way off on the white mic. Okay. Check one, two. Subjectivism and relativism have infected Christianity so much that people no longer strive to live under the truth of God's word, but like to live in the 50 shades of gray of truish as professing Christians. So for those people who say subjectivism and relativism, uh, uh, there's no external truth and there's no absolutes, that's fine if they're not saved. But those that profess Christ, how it translates into their life is they say, they say they're Christians, but they live totally different in what they're saying. It's like saying, and you, if you've been around the church long enough, you know that, that I, I've always struggled with my weight. It's like saying, and, and some of you joked about what diet are you on this time, right? I was always on a diet, and I was always the same weight. Okay? or <laughs> Thank you, Marcy. Or it's, it's like the people, like I've been at churches before. I've been at churches before, and I felt like the Lord wanted us to do a fast. Everybody y'all know that fasting is biblical, right? And I, I felt like the Lord wanted us to do a corporate fast of 40 days. And, and I'll preach a sermon, ser, several sermons about it and why it's important and what we're believing God for because fasting doesn't change God's mind. It just changes your heart. Are you listening? And, and I would say, okay, let's start our fast on this day and, and well-intentioned. Sincere people will come up to me, Carol. Now, I'm not supposed to tell anybody's personal medical information, but y'all don't know them. They'd come up. I know they're brittle diabetic. Does everybody know what brittle diabetic means? They're, they're, they're very diabetic. They're super mega Doppler diabetic. And they would look me straight in the eye, Carol, and say, I feel like the Lord wants me to fast sweets during our fast. And on the end, yeah, I said, well, praise God. But on the inside, I'm like, Junior, you're supposed to be fast and sweets anyway. Subjectivism and relativism have infected people to the point that they don't even see that there's, that there's things going on that they, don't, that, that, that they just blow past. They say one thing and they do another. It's like, um, it's actually, there's a psychological term for it as well. It's called the halo effect. Has anybody ever heard the halo effect? The halo effect basically means this. If you were to poll professing Christians and say, how often do you attend worship services at your church? The number that they say is different than the number that they attend. They always rate themselves higher than they do in actual attendance. It's called the halo effect. And if you don't see it at church, you see it in other people's bad children. Oh, my young one wouldn't do that. Anybody live long enough to know that your child can do that? And probably did do it, and you probably know who they did it with. But we all know at least one person, and if you don't know, if we all, all at least know one person who has a child that can do no wrong. And if you don't know who that person is, then it's probably you and your youngin. I mean, it's the truth. It, it's like the statistic that 30% that of Americans struggle with some kind of mental illness. And so that means if there's three people on the pew, you look to your left and you look to the right, and if it ain't them, it's you. Right? We have this idea that things are different for us. But in Christianity, how many of you know if you don't line yourself up, the, the Word of God is true, always has been true, always will be true, and it is a plumb line. It is a measuring stick. It is a meter stick. Whether you like it or not, it's going to be what you're supposed to do. You don't have to like it, you just have to do it. Or you no longer profess to be a Christian. 
if you're not a Christian or you don't profess to be a Christian, I don't. It never ceases to amaze me the people that get offended about people do about sinners sinning on on sinners sinning. I don't have. I'm not a prophet. I don't have a prophetic bone in my body. But sinners are going to sin. It's the Christians that ought to be ashamed of when they sin, and repent and get right with God about it. It's the professing Christians that make it worse for everybody else. All of us have been around people who have said one thing and done another. Y'all know the expression? Especially in church, when, the, when it's all said and done, there's more said than done. So these belief systems determine how I behave, and I take teeny tiny steps away from absolute truth of God's word, and one day I wake up, hopefully, and realize before I die how wrong I am and how far away from the truth I live. There, there's a, can I tell y'all an inside baseball, a, a behind the scenes kind of thing that, that sometimes preachers joke about? They say, if you're going to move the piano at your church, you don't move it overnight, you move it one inch at a time. And since most people only come to church an average of 1.5 times a month, the next time they show up, it might be halfway to stage. And that's how you move the piano. How many of you all know, it, it, little, anybody ever, if you've ever had, been, had a loved one or you've had a major accident or you've been through something, sometimes you know you, you don't get up in rehab and just start walking. Like, you don't know me, I walk with a limp. You, so you, you start walking. You, some of, you know, sometimes it takes just a, it's them little steps to add up, don't they? The Bible says the small fox does what? The small fox spoils the vine. The little things add up. That one salad you eat is not going to cause you to lose 10 pounds. Eating, watching what you eat, and I'm not talking about just looking at it. Watching your calorie, and watching what you eat for one day, two day, three days is not going to make the difference you want. How many of you all know it's the, the little steps? It's the small things that add up. And the same thing in your spiritual life. If you allow subjectivism and relativism to rule your life, which means I'll do what I want to do when I want to do it, and if the preacher preaches something I don't like, I don't even read my Bible, but if he says something I don't like, I'm not going to do it. Go home and read your Bible. It's about time I've told you all this. If you feel like I've preached something unbiblical, please in love come to me. Don't put me a note under my door. Let me know where you feel like I've been wrong about a situation or circumstance, and I want to talk to you about it. And if I'm wrong, I'll apologize. But a lot of people just have this little, they have this little switch. Anybody got a switch inside them? I ain't talking about the ones like you get your, I'm talking about like there's a switch. And, and, and everybody has a switch. And some of us have it, well, I know I have it, that, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, all right, and I ain't doing that. We all reach a point where we say, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And that happens in your spiritual life as well, and a lot of it comes down to subjectivism and relativism. So as a Christian, you say that your life revolves around and flows from truth, and that truth is not a what, but a who. So as a Christian, you are saying your life revolves around and flows from truth, and the truth is not a what, but a who. That you are saying if anyone should be able to trust anybody, you should be able to trust a Christian. That if I should be able to depend on someone besides Jesus, it should be one of Jesus' representatives. We should be able to. As a Christian, truth is not, is, is not, is not a philosophy. It's not a mindset. It's not an idea or just a statement or book learning. Truth is a who. Truth is a person that is in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I am God in the flesh. I represent literal truth. When you go through the Bible, you see many occurrences referring to God as truth. John 1. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into, came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not grasp it. 
and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we saw his glory. Glory is the only son of the Father, full of grace and truth. When we say that we believe the Bible, why do so many people live today in ways that reject Jesus Christ as truth? If we say we believe the Bible, why do we live such lives? Why do so many people live such lives, lives that say they reject Christ as the truth? It's certainly not because Jesus lived a hypocritical life. Even those who refuse to acknowledge Jesus as Messiah can honestly say he lived and practiced what he preached. Jesus was the personification of love, generosity, compassion, and care for everyone and embraced those that even hated him. If you had to define and look for a truthful life, it would have been the life of Jesus Christ who lived for 33 and a half years on this planet. I think one of the many reasons so many people reject Jesus as absolute truth is because of the hypocritical and spiritually blind ways Christians have walked out their faith in everyday actions, words, and deeds for thousands of years. There's been a lot of stuff done in the name of Jesus that Jesus shouldn't, didn't have anything to do with. There's been a lot of stuff done in the name of God that God didn't have anything to do with. Not the God they were talking about. It was a God, but they were gods unto themselves, little G's. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christians are embarrassingly blind to their own hypocrisy and judgmentalism. Christians are embarrassingly blind to their own hypocrisy and judgmentalism. And it goes like this. I hate judgmental people. I can tell they're judgmental just by looking at them. I'll say that again. Some of y'all missed it. I hate judgmental people. I can tell they're judgmental just by the way I look at them. When we refuse, but look, you know who's going to confront you about your spiritual blindness? The Holy Spirit will. But if you refuse to listen, he's going to quit talking. Many, many years ago, well, I guess 30 years ago, whatever, Time Magazine said, does God still speak? You remember that cover, does God still speak? God's never stopped speaking. But as subjectivism and relativism have infected more of humanity, we no longer, even professing Christians, we no longer tune our radios off of WIIFM, WIIFM, what's in it for me? We tune our radio we, we get the signal stronger for that. We, we profess Christ, but we ignore. Y- y'all remember the old days before digital radios and you just had to do that thing just right? And, and sometimes no matter, it was right yesterday, but the signal from the other station is bleeding over. The Holy Spirit is trying to bleed over and you keep adjusting the knob. You're trying to get it back to WIIFM. What's in it for me? When the truth of the matter is you're supposed to be going back over towards what the Holy Spirit's saying. Right now, there are satellite channels going through this room. There's pornography, there's sports centers, radio stations, XM radio, internet signals. You don't see them, and you don't hear them unless you have the right thing to receive them and tune into them. And most of the time, you've paid the price. And I don't have to pay for, for terrestrial radio. You bought that radio somewhere. You may not have paid a big price, but you paid a price. Well, I don't. Once I bought it, I don't. Did, have you ever met people who argue want to argue about everything? Okay, you're right. You win the prize. You're missing my point. The point is, if you have the right receiver. You can receive the signals that are coming through. You can hear the message. And whether it's a terrestrial radio, just in case you don't know what that means, just just an old school radio. Whether it's a terrestrial radio or you pay for XM, Sirius XM, you, you have to have the right equipment and have paid the price. If you are a Christian, you are saying you're willing to pay the price. If you've paid a price and you're willing to pay a price because nothing worth having is free. Now, Jesus Christ gave freely, but it was not cheap. 
He gave his life. He paid a price. Matter of, the Bible says he paid a debt I could not owe, and I owed a debt I could not pay. No matter how much debt you're in, you, 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 you never could pay the spiritual debt that we were born into. But we think we're, we're like, the, is it Flip, Flip Wilson, the old song, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going? Don't look at me like y'all have never listened to uh, gospel music all your life, that you were just, you, you walk on oil and glow in the dark. Some of y'all know exactly the song I'm talking about. Me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. Well, it might be you and Jesus because you and Jesus don't have a special arrangement. You got to follow the Bible just like the rest of us. Amen, Ken. Subjectivism and relativism have infected you to the point that you think that you don't have to listen to the Holy Spirit. Are you willing to pay the price and listen to what God is saying? To say we are a Christian means we are saying we are all about truth and grace, but we rarely live that out. Jesus brought us a life of truth and grace. Jesus Christ in your life should be a life-changing event, John 8. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. How many of y'all know the word of God? If you continue in, not your opinion about the Bible, I've told y'all this once in love, I'll tell you this again in love, I'm going to smile when I say it. Something comes up and you feel like you need to say something, I don't stand up and say, well, i tell you what mama would have thought about what the church is doing. I don't care what your mama would have thought. What does the Bible say? Are we doing anything unbiblical, heretical, or inappropriate? Then we can talk. But your opinion does not supersede the Word of God. Did you hear what I said? Your opinion does not supersede the Word of God. The, the, the Bible, let me, I'm going to break some of y'all's heart. Can I break your heart today? If you pay attention, most restaurants only get their food from two or three major distributors. And that's why eventually if you go out to eat enough, Sometimes you can pay $5 for it, and sometimes you can pay $8 for it. But the dirty little secret is, it's the same thing. Some of y'all have preferences. All of us have preferences. I have preferences. I like Wendy's. That, that's, that's my preference. I like, I like Wendy's. I like that square hamburger. I like Wendy's. Okay? Wendy likes Burger King. She wants me to take her to the king. So when we want to go get a fast food burger and there's a Wendy's and a Bur Burger King, we compromise and go to Burger King. All right? But the point I'm trying to make is when you really pay attention and you find out they only come from two or three major distributors. Now, each distributor has their own brand and kind of recipe and the way they do things. But they are basically all the same. So a hamburger, unless... How, how, how many of you have been out somewhere to eat, out to eat, and had a hand-padded real burger, burger like, like that's real? You, you know where those places are, don't you? You don't expect that at Wendy's, do you? You don't expect that at McDonald's. You don't expect that at the Hardee's. You, you know exactly where that place is, and you're willing to pay for it because it's different. It's real. It tastes different. You know it. You know it. Do you know God's Word? Not just your opinion. Watch this. Are you ready? Not just your favorite pastor's opinion about the Word of God. Because this may come as a shock to some of you, but not every pastor you listen to is right every time. The Bible says you're supposed to rightly divide the Word of God. So if you can rightly divide it, in, in my simple understanding, if I can rightly divide something, I can wrongly divide it too. If somebody gives me and Mr. Roger $100 and says, here, y'all split this, and I take 80 and give him 20, I've divided it. But I've not rightly divided it. And we go through life, we're supposed to, if Jesus said, if you want to be you, my disciple, you continue in my word. Do we even know the word of God? You would not believe. This is, this is kind of a joke, but it's the truth. How many Christians, when I'm talking to them about lighthearted things, and I'll say, well, y'all know, just like the Bible says, you got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And people say, yeah, that's right, preacher, that's right, that's right. That's Kenny Rogers. That's the gambler. That's not in the Bible. 
You need to know the word of God. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Why, what can, why and how can Jesus set us free? Any false belief that takes you away from the truth of God's word and 50 shades of gray of truish beliefs. Jesus can and will set you free from the lies of life. He will set you free from feeling like you can't find meaning in life. All of us have a blind spot. And you have a spiritual blind spot as well. And if you want to know, ask someone who loves you and has nothing to gain. That's a, those are two very important things. Ask someone who loves you and has nothing to gain but helping you what your blind spot is. But buckle your seatbelt because it's going to hurt your feelings. I'll give you one example. Years and years ago, it's no, it's no secret here that, that Winnie and I strive to be frugal. We believe there's a difference between being cheap and being stingy and being frugal, okay? So we had this little deal. When Everybody remember the Biggie Cup at Wendy's, the Biggie Cup? One time we actually ended up at Wendy's, and we were, we were, we were getting us something to eat, and we ordered, uh, ordered one drink, and we shared the drink. After we ran out, we go up to the counter and get more. And my pastor, who I had asked, he said, Ken, why are you stealing drink? I said, I'm not stealing no drink. I paid for this thing. He said, you paid for one. You didn't pay for two. And I got all huffy and puffy. Anybody else get huffy and puffy when they're confronted? <laughs> A bull. Oh, I can't believe it. Call me out like that. I, I, I pay my tithes. I go. I teach Sunday school. I go to that church. You go. How you call me out like that? I was stealing. I was stealing. So from then on, we got one drink, but I ordered it without ice, and I ordered a separate cup of ice, and I told Miss Winnie. Miss Winnie likes to drink a lot of my drinks. I told her we got to make this last now. Anybody here got somebody in their family that likes to drink a lot? They drink to tell the truth, shame the devil. You know what I'm talking about. Or they just want a bite. So after that, we still order one. So if you ever see Winnie and I out to dinner and there's one drink in front of us, I promise you I don't steal anymore. When I, so, so I was still, I was not a minister at the time. So from then on, the Lord started checking me on things like, now some of y'all going to think, now Ken, this is stupid. You can think it's stupid all you want to. It's all right, you've been wrong before. But if I wanted to print something at work, I'd ask my supervisor, can I print this? Or before everybody had printers and computers at home, I'd say, may I have five sheets of paper? And they always said Yes. But stealing is stealing. Is that not right? And the Bible says if God can't trust you with the small things, he can't trust you with bigger things. And now, now I have access to more things that I could steal and no one would ever know. But God would know. And if I want to grow spiritually, he has to trust me with the so 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 lots of people lots of people lots of people who don't buy lottery tickets say, Boy, I wish I'd win the lottery. I'll tell you what I'd do with it. You we can't even trust you with the twenty dollars you got extra left over in the checkbook. And you think you think God's gonna bless you financially. Little things. The Bible says if he can't trust you to be faithful in little things, he can't trust you to be faithful in larger things. And all of you have seen it. All of you have seen it. Let's go back to the child who never does any wrong. Most of us who know the parents who have a child who never does any wrong, most of them get a thirty dollars or $40,000 car the day they turn 16, and they've probably totaled at least two of them. And then mom and daddy just go right down there and write another check and buy them another car. They've never, they've never had to worry about four different tires, and they're all worn differently, and it burns a quart of oil before the end of the month. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They've never been faithful in little things. And because of that, they don't know the value of things. 
Now think about how important your soul is. Come on, somebody. Think about how important your soul is. The little things, are you willing to see those? Have you been set free from the consequences of the sin and the shame in your life? Jesus Christ can only set you free from the sin and the shame in your life. Because oftentimes we turn to chemicals. We turn to, and, and it could be any chemical, right? Hear me clearly. There is nothing wrong with taking prescription medication. Everybody clear? But we all know there are some people who abuse prescription medication because they're not willing to confront what's going on in their life. People use alcohol. People use sex. People use pornography. People use food. People use all kind of things trying to free themselves and forgetting about what's going on. Only Jesus Christ can truly free us. Jesus Christ can free us from addictions, hurts, and hang-ups, and not only heal our soul, but heal our physical body. There is truth in this life. His name is Jesus, and he can set you free. Are you brave enough today to admit you're living with relativism and subjectivism in your own life as a professing Christian? Because until you're willing to do something about it, it does not matter how many times you're exposed to it. I've used this illustration before. I can bring a pit bull in here who has a history of biting anything close to it. And I can put a muzzle on him and he won't bite. But the, you know what the problem is? The problem is not, not that it, it's because he's still got bite in him. So you can come, you, you can come and hear the sermon and, and, and realize that the Lord is putting a muzzle on you because you're not willing to change. And, and the preacher says something on the inside, you're going, arr, 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 I'd love to get a hold of him. Arr. But you still got bite in you. That's why you ain't willing to admit you're wrong. And if you've lived long enough, you find out you are wrong. Is anyone here right all the time? If you are, please come pray for me. I need to see you right after service. Are you brave enough to admit you may have relativism and subjectivism in your life as a professing Christian? That you have a spiritual blind spot and Satan is manipulating you to live on a scale of 50 shades of gray of truish. It's kind of true. So that's where I'm going to live. Let me make this statement as a question. Anyone here brave enough to admit? I'll start. That I need to get closer to God, not see how far, far further away I can get from Him. Anybody else willing enough to brave enough to raise your hand and say, I, I need to get closer to God, Ken. I'm, 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 I'm willing to admit that I haven't got it all figured out. Before we pray, I want to go back to the definitions of subjectivism and relativism. If you, if you can go back there for me, please, Emily. Because I've left time. What time is it? Somebody tell me. Y'all playing on your phones, tell me what time it is. Thank you. 11.47. I've, I've intentionally made, left time, or tried to, for us to, to spend, time, spend time in prayer at the end of service again. Because you have nothing else to do that you've planned for the next 13 minutes. And let's be honest, if you've been, even if you've been attending church, whether you're a Christian or not, most of you have enough sermons in you to last the rest of your lifetime. It's what are you willing to do about it. If it's a, oh, that's a, that's a wonderful sermon, praise God, that's a wonderful sermon, that, that doesn't make a difference. Who cares? Who cares if it's a wonderful sermon, if it doesn't do anything in your life, if it doesn't change you, if it doesn't impact you, if the seeds don't take root, if it does nothing, then I'm wasting my time and wasting yours. Then all we're doing is gathering together, and, and we're no, no different than gathering together as the Kiwanis or, or the Rotary Club. or what, what, what do we even gather if we're not willing to let the gospel change us? By being professing Christians, we're saying that Christ is growing in us, and we are dying, not occasionally, but we are dying daily. The gospel's been made to be sunshine and lollipops. Rainbows and unicorns. The gospel is no such thing. The, the irony or 
maybe the word's not irony. The irony of, I'm going to use the word irony because I have the microphone. The irony of the gospel is you come and die to be set free. You come and die to yourself to become someone new in Christ. And you cannot do it on your own. Anybody here ever had a car out of line? I know, I know we talk about it a lot, but I actually did own a 65 Mustang one time. And just in case you don't know, one of the most difficult cars to line the front end up on is a Falcon and a Mustang. And here's a dirty little secret. The, the Mustang is built on the chassis of the Falcon. They took a Falcon and put lipstick on it and released a 65 Mustang, 64 and a half Mustang. And you go down the road, and that was way before power steering. Some of y'all remember those days. And there was a couple days where, I, actually a couple weeks, where I had to save up enough money to get the front end lined up. And everywhere I went, I was wore out when I got there. Because you go down the road. Some of y'all never drove something with the front end slam out of line. That if you put on, it, it pulled right. If I had to put on a left turn signal, I had to start way out here to turn left because it took a while. Same thing happens to you spiritually. You might be saying, Ken, I got it. I got it. I'm all right. I got it. I got it. I got it. But you don't got it. You wore out. You sleep, but you don't rest. Did you hear what I said? You sleep, but you don't rest. You wore out. You think, you think well, maybe if I try one more medicine, that'll, that'll fix everything. Maybe if I take one more drink, that'll fix everything. Maybe if I watch porn one more time, that'll fix everything. Maybe if I have my favorite meal, that'll fix everything. Maybe if I go do something I've always wanted to do, that'll fix everything. Let me tell you something. I have to constantly remind my heart and my head, who are in constant war, the Bible says we have to crucify our flesh daily, that this right here is an enemy of the spirit man, of the, that I have to constantly remind myself that no matter, and, and, and so I'm going back to the 65 Mustang, no matter, the, the average 64 and a half Mustang that's restored to mint condition sells for about $18,000, and if I could write a check today and bring it home, next week something will be wrong with it. No matter how much you take care of it, no matter how good you treat it, no matter what happens, eventually it's going to rust and all go away, that no matter what you get, it's never never going to fill that hole like Jesus. Because watch this. I can go ahead and tell you all something. I'm not a prophet. I don't have a prophetic bone in my body. But if someone said, Ken, I want to bless you. Here's $18,000. Go buy a Mustang. I'm going to help pay off my house. And then if you write me another one, and I'm going to pay off my But when the house is paid for, even if I could buy it, I'm going to want something else. I'm going to want a classic Corvette. Now, can't y'all see me unfolding myself out of an old Stingray? But I've already told y'all one day when I have more money than I have since, I'm going to have a great big garage with classic cars parked in it. Right? And watch this. All of them have to have insurance. All of them have to be taken care of. M many, many times we reminisce about the good old days. Anybody remember the good old days? The, 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 you need to quit calling it the good old days because it's D-A-Z-E. You're in a daze. The, the, who here wants to go back to, to uh, outhouses? A anybody here want to go a, a pitcher pump in the kitchen? Anybody here want to go back? Listen, I'm not complaining. I'm telling you the truth. The first time this year it's been 99 and 100 degrees, our air conditioner died at home. You find out how spiritual you are when you locked up in the house. And Emma's home from college, too. And y'all know we cook at home. Anybody here want to go back to days without central air conditioning? Winnie never waves a hanky. She's over here waving. But we get ourselves in a mindset that we think we know what's best for us. You hear me? We think. Now, now most of us look at our children, and we're able to help them understand. You think you know, but we confront our children's blind spots all the time. Jake and I were working hard in the yard yesterday, and at one point he said something. I was like, "Well, let's let's, or we could do this." And he stopped and went, 
would it hurt you to be wrong one time? I said, well, I'm not used to hearing that, Jack. How about I say that one more time? But as adults, we have this attitude, I'm grown. I do what I want to do. I know what I'm doing. And watch this. There are many women of God sitting in this congregation who could give you wisdom and guidance and help, but instead you look to whatever is being said on social media or whoever or, or, or Oprah. I don't know who, I, do those people even come on TV anymore? You 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 look up old you look, you look up old episodes of Donahue and Sally Jesse Raphael and and see what they say. When there's many and watch this, when you are brave enough to ask them, you ignore what they tell you. Most people want you to tell them what they want to hear. There are some people, I ain't going to call their name in this congregation. If you don't want to know, don't ask. Because they will tell you and believe Jesus can heal your feelings later. And if you want to know who they are, come ask me and I'll tell you who to ask. But I've already told you, buckle your seatbelt. Don't ask me. And some of you I've had to tell in love. You've come to me for counseling or advice, and I'll say, let's do this, this, and this. And in four or five weeks, let's, let's re meet back in four or five weeks. And in four or five weeks, I'll message you and say, have you done da, 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 da. And if you say, I've done nothing, then on our second visit, I'm going to say, when are you going to do da, da, da. And if you say, I'm not sure, I'll say, well, when you do da, 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 we can meet again. Because I don't charge, and I'm not a professional counselor. And if you're looking for sympathy, you can find it on Facebook all day long. You can put up there, I have an unspoken prayer request, and people will find out. People will find out what's going on with you, right? Ken, that's ugly. No, it's not ugly. I, subjectivism and relativism have infected us, and I'm running out of prayer time. Subject, relativism is the doctrine that Knowledge, truth, morality exist in relation to culture. Nothing is absolute, and subjectivism means that there is no external or objective truth. Y'all, there has to be truth, or what we're doing out here is a lie. There has to be truth of some kind. You go out here, I'm not saying miracles don't happen, but you go out here one of these Bradford pears, and you pray in the Holy Ghost and, and rub that tree with anointing oil until you rub a bald spot on it, and unless a miracle is supposed to happen, that tree is not going to bear pears today. There is truth in this world. Stand up with me. We're going to pray about the truth, the life, and the way. Thank you, Lord. That, Father, we don't live in 50 shades of gray of truish. That, Lord, we can be delivered from our sins and set free. Most of us don't even know we have a blind spot, but we believe the 50 shades of gray of true for so long, we're not willing to admit it. Bow your heads. Bow your heads. Nobody looking around. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, are you ready to receive Christ and be saved from your sins? If you'd like to meet me at the front, I'd love to pray with you today. Would anybody like to come forward today? Would you be brave enough to raise your hand and say, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be spiritually, but Ken, just remember me. I'm not going to call you out. Is there anybody here today? I'll not call you to the front. Is there anybody here? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now are you brave enough to raise your hand and say, Ken, I want somebody to in love tell me what my blind spot is spiritually. Raise your hand right now. Nobody's looking around what my blind spot is. Lord, help me see my blind spot today. Oh, Jesus, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Holy Ghost, move and work. You can put your hands down. Thank you, Lord, for being willing to forgive us of our sins. And, Lord, right now, if you raise your hand to any of those things, I'm, I've already told you I'm not calling you forward today anymore. If you've prayed, those, if you've raised your hand, I want you to pray with me. Now, Ken, I didn't raise my hand. What am I supposed to do? I want you to pray just in case the person with you raised their hand because they're ready to move on from where they are and grow in the knowledge and the grace of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth and pray with me, church. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that you're going to put men and women of God in our paths that help expose our blind spots, that you help us, Lord, to grow in the knowledge and the grace of Jesus Christ, that, Father, you can help us and show us and guide us and lead us and put people in our way that tell us in love what we need to do and how we need to do it. Father, thank you, God, for being a God who cares about every intimate, personal, and private detail of our 
our life, that, Father, we can be delivered from our sins, we can be set free, and we can grow in the knowledge and the grace of Christ. Father, use us as witnesses, as examples, as what you want to do and how you want to do in the earth, Father, that we not live and are willing to con be confronted about subjectivism and relativism, relativism and how it's infected our lives and our spirit. God, help us to grow and be delivered from our sins. We thank you, God, for helping us, Lord. And I look forward to the praise of your people as they honor and lift up and glorify God for what he's done and what he's going to do in their life. Father, let us be receptive to what you want to do and how you want us to grow. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, amen. Bump elbows with two or three people and say, we'll see you Wednesday night at 6.30.